So we'll start with our first lecture on uh, volcanic hazards by Chuck Connor from University of South Florida. Thanks, Diana, and, and uh, thanks to the organizers. Um, we're uh, in the coming week. We're shifting gears a little bit and moving into uh, surface processes and many of the talks and uh, interactions and things like that. So my goal today is to really provide a framework for uh, quantitative probabilistic volcanic hazard assessment. So if you've been wondering how your research fits into hazard models, I'm trying today to um, provide a structure, an overview at least of what we do currently, um, perhaps some things that are going to evolve relatively quickly in the future. I'm not getting into the details of a lot of the specific processes like uh, PDCs or um, lahars. Those talks are coming later in the week. So this is a uh, a uh, bit of a view from 10,000 feet and um, uh, really about the structure of doing probabilistic volcanic hazard assessment. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to talk about a few examples that I um, sort of thought of using uh, based on the discussion yesterday about topics and projects and that sort of thing. And um, over on the left, you see uh, a, uh, the consequences of a disaster, of a, of a non-eruptive event I worked on in Guatemala um, following Hurricane Stan. So um, Hurricane Stan was a pretty impactful hurricane in Guatemala, dumped about a meter of rain in a 24-hour period and caused a lot of slopes instability, including on Toliman Volcano. So uh, at Toliman, a debris flow was generated inundated the town of Panaba, which um, at the time, we thought it killed 300 people, but it turns out later studies said it killed about 900 people. And so um, it's, uh, I believe, the largest disaster in the 21st century so far, unfortunately. And it's a non-eruptive event. Um, it's caused by um, alteration of uh, pyroclastic products and, and uh, the remobilization during rainfall. Um, it's also a good example of uh, the social aspect of volcanic hazards. So um, as you know, there was a 30-year civil war in Guatemala. Um, indigenous people were displaced as a result of that and of that civil war and occupied this area. Panaba, the name of this town, this village is a, a Shukatil word, word. It's like a derivative of the Mayan dialect. And uh, it means place of mud and rock in their language. And uh, so you know, in, in terms of cultural perspective, people were aware, well, well aware of the hazards and they were really only displaced there by the Civil War. Um, we went there at the inv invitation of an NGO called Oxfam and uh, uh, they had spent quite a lot of cash and invested quite a lot of resources in building um, essentially housing for people displaced by this disaster. And their question immediately was, do we build it in the right spot, or is the same thing going to happen? Which you can imagine is, a, is quite a serious question. And in fact, they did build it in the wrong spot, was our conclusion. And they subsequently moved it. And also, in that middle panel, you can see the uh, rural hospital is inundated by the flow. And um, so that brings up another aspect of volcanic hazards, is that when critical facilities are damaged, um, it multiplies the effects of the hazard. So you can imagine being a medical person in the hospital when the mud flow comes down the hill in the middle of the night and you have to deal with that. Um, and immediately you're inundated by um, people in uh, great need of your services. And so uh, hazards associated with critical facilities are a big issue. So that's a non-eruptive event, right? Um, definitely a consequence of volcanic activity, but non-eruptive. In the upper uh, right-hand panel, there's a histogram, and that shows new cases of unexplained kidney disease per 1,000 agricultural workers uh, in the area of Chinandega, Nicaragua. And what you see is there's a rapid change in uh, the uh, frequency of these events, and the epidemiologist involved in this, Christy Murphy, thinks that excess fatalities are probably about 1,000 people. Uh, and the, the source of the disease in kidney failure is, is accumulation of trace metals, particularly nickel, um, in uh, the kidneys of agricultural workers. Well, cause isn't, a, you know, a correlation is not causation, but this correlates with a 
ramp up in activity in the Maribios range and tougher fallout over these plantations and agricultural areas due to very small volume eruptions of uh, Talica, San Cristobal, Cerro Negro volcanoes. Uh, the range kind of lit up in the mid-90s and um, continued. And so one question is, is uh, uh, are explosions through the hydrothermal systems of these volcanoes causing this excess nickel to accumulate in drainages and affect uh, agricultural workers? So again, that's a, uh, it's a cascading impact potentially of volcanic activity. We don't normally think of uh, these mild VEI-1 eruptions as, as having any social impact at all. Certainly we think of uh, vulcan the products of volcanoes uh, to have uh, uh, impacts that enhance, enhance agricultural activity, but that's not necessarily uh, the only consequence of that. So, uh, and then the third example, is a different sort entirely. It's a headline, uh, Japan court orders shutdown of nuclear reactor near volcano. Well, that's uh, um, an active crater in Aso Caldera in Japan. Aso, many of you realize, has had a series of quite explosive uh, volcanic eruptions, such as the, the Aso 4 uh, ignimbrite, which inundated the island of Kyushu. The reactor is not that close by. It's on the uh, island of Shikoku, about 130 kilometers from uh, the volcano. And so, um, as you can imagine, there's great sensitivity about the safety of nuclear facilities in Japan. And uh, the question is, is it realistic? Is it, is it, is it true that uh, we shouldn't operate, or they shouldn't operate a nuclear facility 130 kilometers away based on the potential but low probability of event of uh, another ASO4 eruption, which of course would have huge implications for people living on Shikoku, so, uh, on Kyushu. So we have a, um, I'm, I'm asking you to think broadly <laughs> about volcanic hazards. It's not only about um, PDCs descending the side of the volcano. Uh, that's certainly an extremely important process. It's not only about eruptive processes generally, but it's about these cascading effects uh, that we have to deal with. Okay, so um, to do that, quantitatively, we think about hazard forecasts. And I, uh, you know, language is important. I differentiate between the word forecast and prediction. Um, not, and you don't necessarily have to, but um, in general, a prediction is a statement that an event will or will not happen during some time frame. The volcano will erupt tomorrow. Uh, that's, that's one use of the prediction. Now, sometimes people add a probability to that. Uh, there's a 60% chance, or there's a high likelihood the volcano will erupt tomorrow. And I would argue that you're no longer making a prediction, you're making a forecast. Uh, so a forecast is there's a 30% chance of rain tomorrow. There's a 30% chance that the volcano will erupt tomorrow. And, and there are um, a whole series of questions embedded in that. I've just summarized a few of them. But you know, what hazardous phenomena are likely to occur associated with volcanoes? How frequently do they occur? What are the rates of activity? Um, how likely they, are they in some time frame? A uh, uh, probability model always specifies, specifies a time frame. It might be over the next weeks, or it might be an annual probability, or a probability in a 10,000 year period. And what areas are potentially impacted and how? And so traditionally uh, in volcanology, we've, we've made this distinction between long-term forecasts and short-term forecasts. It's just a, a convenience. And I've tried to figure out where this came from, and the earliest reference I found is in, from a textbook uh, by Howell Williams, he, in collaboration with Alexander McBurney, came out uh, really within months of the passing of Howell Williams. He's a very famous uh, volcanologist from UC Berkeley. I think he was a chair of this department in the 40s. So uh, basically an early actor in volcanology and a classical geologist, he, People think he mapped more than 10,000 square kilometers and uh, really sorted out a lot of volcanic processes. So he seems to have thought deeply about this. Uh, Long-term hazard assessment primarily based on the geologic record and analogous volcanoes. The idea is that a long-term forecast should take place well in advance of any volcanic activity. So it's essentially a planning uh, exercise. Um, you know, is it dangerous to live near Nevada del Ruiz or not? You know, you can do that in advance. And then short-term forecasts generally incorporate data on 
volcanic unrest, use of geophysical signals uh, related to the expected timing and nature of volcanic eruptions. So we've talked a, quite a bit about that already, and we'll talk more about that in coming days. Um, it's a bit of a false dichotomy, of course. You know, why can't I use geophysical instrumentation, geophysical data to inform my long-term hazard assessment? Um, how does the geologic record inform what I think is going to happen in the short term during volcanic unrest? So I believe this distinction is going to blur, continue to blur over time, but it's still a fairly useful way to think about how um, hazards operate. So it brings up the idea um, that if you're going to do this, if you're going to quantify volcanic hazards, you better have a pretty good idea of what probability means and what it means to who. And so you're all familiar with the idea that you can calculate risk uh, based on the convolution of a probability and the consequences or the vulnerability of people to that activity or both. Uh, might be cast in deaths. Risks have, risk has units, deaths, uh, dollars, lost, that kind of thing. Probability is unitless, of course. And um, so probabilistic volcanic hazard assessment stops with the probability. Um, but the probability means different things to different people, and it comes up all the time. So think about the ranges of probability that we actually care about in volcanic hazard assessment. Uh, if uh, Diana or Toby, Tobias, are going to put an instrument on a volcano, uh, the gas uh, instrument, um, you know, maybe they accept the, accept the idea that there's a 50-50 or 1 in 10 chance that that instrument will be destroyed in a given year, right? I'm going to take that risk. I'm doing that um, uh, with my instrument. And then with uh, a lot of infrastructure, we accept a relatively high loss rate. So the southern ring road in Iceland goes around the south part of the island. Uh, pretty much it's accepted that that road will be destroyed by volcanic activity every decade or every few decades. And society invests in that and rebuilds the road. So we accept, say, a 1 in 100 or 1 in 10 chance of uh, destruction of those kinds of facilities. And then communities um, uh, accept a range of probabilities. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. And then finally, critical facilities are those facilities whose destruction multiplies the impacts of, of uh, uh, the event. Generally, society accepts even lower probabilities for that. So if we uh, think about that hospital, you know, we might not accept a probability of more than 1 in 10,000 of the hospital would be destroyed in a, in a uh, debris flow. And if we think about the nuclear power plant, uh, what probability do you accept for a volcanic eruption destroying a nuclear power plant? Uh, and it turns out that societies generally accept, say, one in a million per year or one in 10 million per year. And if you're building a radioactive waste repository where you want to isolate waste uh, from the environment for a million years, maybe you accept a probability of ten, one times 10 to the minus eight. So it really depends on who you are. And then getting back to the communities, um, this, this is real. So just uh, a few weeks ago, um, uh, Carlos Lavarde and other people from the uh, uh, Colombian Geological Survey contacted me. They had made a map of Galeras. The probability for lahar inundation in this town was, you know, one in ten thousand. And the local people, the you know, administration said, "Okay, we don't have to worry." <laughs> and they asked me, "Well, you know, how do we address that concern?" And the answer is that the the for a community and for people living in the community, the probability that really depends on who you are, right? So. If you're in your 80s, uh, your annual probability of dying might be on the order of 5 or 10%, right? Uh, so not quite 10%, but you know, 5% 5, 5 say. And uh, so 1 in 10,000 is a pretty small number. You might not want to leave. That, that might kill you, right? You might want to stay put and, and, and uh, uh, take your chances with a volcano. And people actually make that decision. There's a ferry, uh, you know, uh, there was a guy, Harry Truman, on the, at Spirit Lake on Mount St. Helens in his 80s, and he basically said, you know, blank, 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 I'm not leaving. And, um, you know, maybe for him that was a correct decision. He died but in the eruption, but, um, uh, you know, he's, his, he was weighing his chances given his time in life, maybe not in a very quantitative way, but uh, in some sort of, Way. But on the other hand, a 10-year-old 
I mean, nobody would say a 10-year-old should stay at, ten, at, at Crater Lake, I mean, at uh, Spirit Lake, right, on the flanks of Mount St. Helens. So what's the deal with that? Well, what's the probability of a 10-year-old dying in a given year worldwide? Anybody know? Must be pretty low, right? It's a horrible question. I'm sorry. It's Saturday morning. <laughs> it's like you don't even want to think about it. <laughs> so the probability of a 10-year-old dying worldwide is about 1 in 10,000 per year, okay? So we would like to reduce that number. But so if you're in a Lahar zone and the probability is 1 in 10,000, then for that 10-year-old, your likelihood of dying in a year doubled. Okay, you can roughly add that probability together, uh, and you can double it. So obviously, that's a grave risk for some members of the population. And so that range really involves um, you know, who you're talking about and how they react to that hazard, and perhaps uh, what other hazards exist in their life um, anyway. So, there, so it's a very complicated thing, but we should be aware of that eight order of magnitude variation in uh, probability that's of concern to at least some people in the community. Now, if we think about examples of long-term hazard assessment, we can start with very simple and relatively regional views. So uh, here's an example, I would argue, of a volcanic hazard map solely based on map data for what, you know, what's happened in the past. So this is a uniformitarian view of regional hazards, and I think it's an excellent view. And so the color scheme there uh, basically uh, maps the ages of products at the surface in a sort of smooth and general way. And you can see that if you um, live in the eastern volcanic zone, you're likely at a higher hazard rate than elsewhere in Iceland for the most part, and so on. And so that's probably an adequate analysis for many people. So Iceland is becoming Google uh, data farm, you know, server farm central, uh, sort, of, sort of between uh, Europe and the United States, so transmission is fast, it's cool outside, so you don't have to spend a lot of money on cooling servers and that sort of thing. So if you have a choice about where you're going to put your facility, you look at that map and I'm going with blue, <laughs> right? I'm going to stay in the blue zone. And for that purpose, this map is... Um, pretty useful, so it's a sort of a uniformitarian view based on the geologic record. Of course, most people don't have that choice, or a lot of people don't have that choice. They live where they live, and if you live near a volcano, then you have to deal with uh, probabilities, and you probably want a more accurate picture of what your hazard rate is. And so this is an example from Augusto Neri and uh, Andrea Babalacqua and colleagues uh, for a conditional probability of inundation of PDCs in the Campe Fulgure region around Naples, in Naples basically, uh, uh, given um, that an event occurs. So when I say conditional probability, I'm basically saying, uh, uh, I'm gonna assume some sequence of events occurs, in this case an explosive, I'm gonna assume an explosive eruption occurs, and I have a variety of outcomes possible based on, say, the magnitudes of those events, their likelihood to generate PDCs, the likely run out of those PDCs, and so on. So they've looked at that con conditional probability. Given the eruption, what are the likely consequences? And they've mapped that in terms of probability. So in the center there, 60% means that they think that if uh, this region experiences an explosive eruption, there's 60% probability basically that Pozzoli is going to be inundated by uh, PDCs and the probability decreases with distance. So this is the marriage of a conceptual model of how this volcano works, a numerical model uh, which forecasts the run out of the PDC, in this case a highly simplified numerical model because they wanted to run it tens of thousands of times to make that map. So they had to make decisions about how to simplify the numerics to uh, make the map. And this is also doubly st stochastic. There's a probability there, and you can see the 95th percentile up in the corner. That means uh, the different people had different ideas about what the probability distribution was for, um, say, magnitude of the eruption. And so they've tried to account for that, and this is the most conservative map. So. Uh, uh, again, for a specific phenomena and for a specific conditional probability, um, it's definitely practical to calculate a map like this and then compare it to the kinds of rates that are acceptable to your community.
Uh, in the short term, there's a variety of uses for probabilistic volcanic hazard assessment. This is a very simple one from uh, the Fogo eruption in 2014. Um, a vent formed on the southwest flank of Pico de Fogo and started emitting a lava flow. And um, so here we have a conditional probability. We, the, 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 the volcano is already erupting. It's already producing an effusive eruption. Where is that effusive eruption likely to go? And there's a wonderful paper by uh, Capello and uh, Chiro del Negro and others where they incorporated satellite data to update their forecast as the eruption continued. Uh, and that's that panel on the, on the lower left there which shows um, how the uh, uh, eruption progressed into the eventual footprint of the lava flow. Uh, we were asked basically to run simulations for what will happen if the eruption continues and the volume of the eruption gets larger and larger. And so we um, provided um, volcanologists on the scene with a series of maps with varying volumes and our forecast of where the lava flows were likely to go uh, based on that vent location. So it's a very simple use. So you can, you can make a probabilistic determination uh, based on the magnitude of the eruption about which areas are going to be inundated and which aren't. Um, and this map also points out some of the difficulties with doing this. Because if I had just moved that vent around a little bit, um, say during the eruption or hypothetically, um, I would have completely changed the direction of flow. And, and so that argues that I really do need to take a probabilistic view, even with this numerical model. I have to say, well, what happens? What's the likelihood of a event shift and so on? So that's a kind of a simple example for doing this. And uh, Kathy already showed this slide earlier in the week. Seems like it was a week ago. <laughs> oh, oh, it was, anyway. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, Short-term volcanic hazard assessment for um, Soufriere Hills volcano in Montserrat. It's a famous example of using an event tree to organize your thoughts and to calculate probabilities based on the likelihood of events. And so in the left-hand part of the diagram, there's a, uh, uh, the first um, sort of development of, you know, will there be a magmatic eruption or is the activity, is the unrest non-magmatic? Will a dome form, or will there be an explosion, and so on? So those are examples of a binary tree. So if you uh, if you uh, look at the probabilities for first dome out or first uh, explosion out, 0.65 and 0.35 add up to one. So in this tree, people feel like those are the two scenarios, right? And uh, probabilities are assigned to that. I'll get back to that in a minute. And as the eruption continues, you get to uh, more and more um, specific scenarios, and ultimately on the right-hand side of the plot, people are interested in the relative probabilities of events. Uh, will there be a pyroclastic flow? Will there be uh, edifice collapse and so on? Um, those are specific outcomes which you can, say, plan for, and those probabilities are um, uh, may sum to one or maybe not, depending on whether you think events, uh, you know, more than one of these events can happen. Okay, so in this case, the black line, the big black line shows the progress of the eruption and the forecasting uh, that took place. So this eruption, as you know, you know, took place eventually over a very long period of time, and uh, the model changed with time. And the way people assess the model changed with time. So Willie uh, Aspinall and Roger Cook uh, suggested early on in this eruption that an expert elicitation take place. And so what that means is you get a bunch of people together and they have opinions <laughs> about uh, uh, whether thing, you know, what is the problem, is, is it magmatic or not, uh, based on where they're coming from and, and their expertise. And you combine those opinions to generate a group probability. Uh, and so expert elicitation is widely used, uh, uh, especially, it turns out, in long-term volcanic hazard assessment to understand relative hazards and risks. Sometimes expert judgment is weighted. So Willie will actually give you a test to see you know, how good a volcanologist you are or how much your volcanology agrees with his or whatever. Exactly, exactly. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there's a, um, well, there's a whole science of estimation. Um, when you think about it, volcanologists uh, and all geoscientists have to estimate all the time, right? Um, what's the volume of the deposit? It's an estimation. And so um, you might use methods, you might use numerical methods to estimate that volume, but probably the important number is your range. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure the volume of the deposit is more than X and less than Y, right? And that's really the guts of it. And, and in expert elicitation, you weight that range as well. So, so it's quite a complex topic. I'm not talking too much more about expert elicitation, but that's what happens in short-term hazard assessment. And of course, you can combine these things. This is a, another paper by Augusto Neri and colleagues where um, they basically have a long-term event tree they've developed for Vesuvius um, prior to volcanic activity. And the hope is that once activity begins, they can use the same tree. They don't have to add branches to the tree as, uh, as the eruption progresses. And so you can do what-if scenarios or counterfactual scenarios if you want and um, see if, uh, uh, what the response ought to be to that kind of thing. So, so in this case, um, this is part of an event tree and the red follows the sequence of events that they're, they're testing out in a scenario to understand how they should respond to that sort of activity. And in this tree, you can see that um, many of the surface processes, like tougher fallout, are repeated among different branches, right? And so um, uh, we have to be very careful when we use trees to understand what the total probability of, say, tougher fallout might be based on these different scenarios. Okay, so this suggests that we need a hierarchy or a hierarchical approach to hazard assessment, whether it's long-term or short-term. And so these are some steps in, in uh, probabilistic volcanic hazard assessment, which are sort of widely applied and, and um, used in the community. Step one is to have a conceptual model of how the volcano works. And um, a lot of what we heard this week fits in directly to understanding the conceptual model of the volcano. So do I need to worry about a caldera forming eruption? What's the probability that I need to worry about that? Uh, will the volcano uh, have a, an effusive behavior? And what types of effusive behavior? Do I have to worry about distributed volcanism? Or is the central vent the main thing at this particular volcanic system? Those depends on a conceptual model, and in fact, that conceptual model basically drives the entire structure of the tree I just showed you, right? That's based on a conceptual model of how Vesuvius works. So that's a place where volcanological insight, petrological insight plays an important role in hazard assessment. We have to assess rates of activity, of course, if we're gonna understand probability. And that might be based, as I said, on historic observations or radiometric age determinations. It might be based on uh, short -term, in short-term forecasts on unrest and observations. We have to forecast the potential location of activity, the magnitude, and ultimately the potential impacts. And I might use the geologic record for impacts as they did in Iceland on that Iceland map, or I might use numerical models as they did at Vesuvius. So that creates a, that, those, that, that laundry list now appears on the left-hand side of the, um, of, of the slide, and you can follow along as we go through uh, how we're addressing different parts of that laundry list. I want to point out that PVHA wasn't developed in a vacuum. Uh, uh, a lot of it comes from probabilistic seismic hazard assessment, and um, there was a guy named Alan Cornell working as a professor of engineering at Stanford in 1968, and he said, wow, you know, even though we can't uh, predict earthquakes, we should be able to say something about seismic hazards and forecasts. And he developed, literally on his own, as far as I can tell, a, a systematic approach to this sort of se seismic hazard assessment. Why did he do that in the mid-60s? Well, uh, in the early 60s, there was a great effort to build a nuclear power plant at Bodega Bay. Anybody know where that is? <laughs> just north of here, exactly on the San Andreas Fault. And, you know, engineers thought, this is a nice spot. Look, look, look at the view. We're going to build a nuclear power plant here. And uh, it got to the point where the foundation of that power plant was built before somebody said, you know, there's a fault over there. Maybe we should check that out. So probabilistic seismic hazard assessment was born. It really was that simple. So we need to characterize sources and activity. 
Uh, obviously, for us, that involves a conceptual model of how the volcano works, where it is, what, what is going to happen, a recurrence rate model. Um, our results depend a lot on a recurrence rate model. That's, of course, the Gutenberg-Richter relationship, which shows frequency-magnitude relationships. If you make the wrong assumption about that, you get your probability wrong, right? So a magnitude 9 earthquake happens in Tohoku. Well, uh, prior to that, scientists thought the magnitude rolled off, and you'd never get greater than an 8.3 in Tohoku, and it turned out to be wrong with our consequences for many people and, and uh, a nuclear facility. Then in step three, uh, for seismic, you need a, a, a ground motion attenuation function, which is like how the uh, magnitude, how the spectrum of peak acceleration changes with distance from the event. And you might have many alternative models and, and data assumptions, varying model complexity. The equivalent for us might be a PDC model. Is it based on H over L and uh, sort of a, a ballpark estimate of of how far the PDC will go, or is it based on a sophisticated numerical model? And then you wind up with the probability of exceedance, uh, which is the expected acceleration at the site, or the probability that acceleration will exceed some value. If you're not used to that kind of graph, uh, you can think of, a, of it as a survivor function. So if I'm standing in the crater of a volcano, how long can I stand there and expect to live? I mean, it's kind of an awful question, but it's a good one. Uh, if you're a gas geochemist. And so you should, uh, uh, you should think about the survivor function, right? And um, uh, so there's some chance, uh, you, have a, you have a pretty good chance of experiencing, in this case, low accelerations um, uh, and the probability that acceleration is exceeded, say, at, at, at 0.5 or 1 or 2 Gs, uh, increases to the left. And if the curve looks like that, then it's a Poisson process um, memory memoryless uh, hazard, and of course, those curves have different shapes. So that's cast uh, as an equation. That process is cast as an equation down there, and basically what we're doing is we're multiplying those conditional probabilities together to get the probability the ground acceleration will exceed some value in some specified time period, delta t. Okay. Um, the five steps that I outlined before and uh, Cornell's PSHA uh, sort of imply a different sort of event tree than uh, a, a different sort, sort of tree than what I showed you before is in an event tree. So the event tree actually tries to forecast events. Nodes on that, on that graph, that directed graph, are um, events. We can also think of a logic tree where um, over on the left-hand side we have rates, uh, locations, magnitudes, impacts, and then an ensemble model. And if we take location, for example, we might have alternative models, statistical, geophysical, or whatever, for where event would be located. So the node, instead of being an alternative events, is alternative models that forecast the probability of that event. Uh, and so that's the standard, in, especially in long-term hazard assessment. And as we move across that tree, we wind up with an ensemble model which we can calculate, uh, for, from which we can calculate um, expected probability of a particular happening, lava flow or PDC, uh, considering a range of models. So wow, you know, you don't, you don't agree on the conceptual model of the volcano. You don't agree about the volume of magma stored in the subsurface. That's okay. Um, consider alternative models and uh, argue about weighting them. Maybe you don't agree about that, but eventually you wind up with an ensemble which hopefully does a better job of uh, forecasting than you would have on your own, only considering one, one model. And of course, the columns in this are now interchangeable. Like I can, I can calculate the, the location before I calculate the magnitude and, or after the magnitude and so on. And the figure on the uh, right there is that um, exceedance probability plot for some phenomena. Right, which is the output of that process. Okay, so how do you do that? Um, well, uh, for long-term hazard assessment, a lot of this procedure, as, as in seismic hazard assessment, a lot of the procedure is driven by um, actually these critical facilities, and in particular, um, nuclear power plants and safe siting of nuclear power plants and nuclear facilities. So. One of the first organizations to think about applying PSHA to PVHA 
was, is an organization, a UN organization called the International Atomic Energy Agency. And a guy named Antonio Godoy from Argentina basically pushed this very hard uh, to create a staged-like analysis that you might follow to really understand um, what the likelihoods of uh, disruption of a facility is due to um, volcanic activity. We're particularly interested in a hierarchical approach. So if, you're, if your facility is in Nebraska, probably you don't have to do the analysis, right? Okay, or, or only for a very specific scenario of events. But if your facility is the Trojan nuclear power plant near Mount St. Helens, maybe you want to have an advanced sort of study done. So it's a hierarchical approach going from left to right, starts with initial scoping studies. Um, this document, you can download these uh, by searching on IAEA Volcanic Hazards 2012 and 2016. Uh, these, this, this procedure was first proposed in the mid-90s. Uh, the IAEA is a UN organization. UN member states, nations, have to approve it. Um, when it was first proposed in the mid-90s, it was not approved by member states. And uh, the states that objected were France and Germany, and they did it over uh, volcanic hazards in the Rhine-Graben. They didn't want this document out there. And so time went by. Uh, Tohoku happened in 2011. The document was approved by the guy by 120 nations approved this document in 2012. So it's a good run at how to do, um, how to organize a hazard assessment. And of course, it's compromised. There's compromise in it. So you see some weird things in there like, Initial scoping, is their volcanism less than 10 million years old? Well, 10 million, why? <laughs> Seems absurd. And uh, to make a long story short, we had, the volcanologists had conceptual model over there. And uh, you know, the IAEA, especially the engineers, basically said, no way. Uh, you need to give us a number there. And so we gave them a pretty conservative number. And uh, <laughs> so, so you know, there's all kinds of things like that. And, and, um, uh, the way it's applied. But let me give you a few examples. So initial scoping studies, in terms of initial scoping studies, here's a, um, one of the most expensive volcanology projects in the history of the United States. Uh, how do you site a radioactive waste repository? Many of you remember um, in the 80s, I guess most of you don't remember, but in the 80s, the uh, uh, Yucca Mountain facility was proposed in Nevada as a place where the US would store radioactive waste. And you know, a few years later, somebody said, isn't that a volcano sitting over there? Should we do a volcanic hazard assessment? And so um, that project was born. Well, in initial scoping, people were, were, were well aware of the Timber Mountain Caldera complex to the north. In fact, Yucca Mountain is a giant ignimbrite sheet from that volcano uh, eruption. But um, the conceptual model, of course, is the tectonic setting has changed. So we don't expect ignimbrite flare-ups in Nevada anytime soon. But on the other hand, there's a whole bunch of dots, uh, red and blue on that map, which represent volcanoes of different ages. Uh, it is a site of basin range volcanism. So, so you do do a probabilistic hazard assessment for that. And uh, Greg Valentine, Frank Perry, and others were heavily involved in, in that full probability assessment over a long period of time. Uh, if you think that's a rare <laughs> event, I hate to say it, it's not. Uh, this is an example of a crude geologic map from a report uh, presented to the Jordanian Atomic Energy Commission. The nation of Jordan wants to build a nuclear power plant out in the uh, eastern desert um, near Syria and Iran and Iraq. But anyway, there it is, the JNPP site. Uh, there's extensive volcanism uh, in, in Syria. Yeah. How often should, the maps or the documents? Yeah, yeah, um, obviously um, these things should be living documents, right? Uh, so and hazard assessments should change as new information becomes available. In practice, especially in the nuclear business, that tends not to happen. Um, and I'll tell you a few stories about how it doesn't happen later, but um, well, I'll tell you one right now. The uh, Tohoku power plant uh, that was destroyed was subject to review for tsunami hazard assessment in 2006 and 2007. And if they had followed those recommendations, they probably wouldn't have lost the diesel generators. So, so there are people who try to update these things. 
Okay, the long short story is that um, volcanologists were employed by Western Geico uh, and um, discovered that uh, volcanoes of the Harad al-Sham were too close by and uh, that site was uh, eventually abandoned. It wasn't ab abandoned by the Jordanian government. It was abandoned by Ross Atom, Russian uh, nuclear consortium that was gonna build the plant. Um, okay, so once we get through this initial scoping, we have to characterize sources of activity. Um, there's the idea of different phenomena, like the opening events, periclastic flows. You have to consider their effects. Okay, so in characterizing sources of activity, I'll just give you a few quick examples. Uh, this is a photo of the, sorry about my pronunciation, uh, Mülheim Karlsch plant uh, in the Rheingraben. It was constructed in the 1980s but never operated at great expense. Uh, the guy in the white hair there is uh, Hans Schminke. He and his group had spent quite a lot of time mapping in this area, and they discovered that the power plant was constructed on uh, volcanoclastic sediments, which basically represented remobilization uh, following, of, of surge deposits following the Locker Sea eruption. And so uh, uh, the distribution of pyroclastic rocks, uh, uh, fallout and surge are shown there. At B on the map, there's a um, uh, this area of constriction in the Rhine River, which they think caused a tephra dam to form, basically a dynamic dam uh, formed during the eruption, flooded the area in gray, including the area of the power plant, producing these uh, volcanic clastic sediments. So based on seismic hazard and volcanic hazard, uh, that area was deposited. That's what I mean by characterizing sources. Sometimes it's cascading impacts that are important. Another example, um, which I worked on quite a lot, is the Armenian nuclear power plant. Uh, shown there um, near a scoria cone. Well, how old is the scoria cone? Uh, why is the scoria cone there? Power plants on the south side of a very large ignimbrite shield volcano, uh, literally covered in low aspect ratio ignimbrites. It's a beautiful place. And very large volume lava flows, including Poker Bagatlu there over on the west, a 18 cubic kilometer day site flow, and so on. So, um, uh, in this case, you need to do a uh, uh, full-on hazard assessment. The geochemistry and tectonics was super important in this investigation because people said, hey, these volcanoes are extinct. You know, yeah, our rot's across the road. It, it erupted in the Holocene, but, you know, we're okay. And um, so developing this uh, collisional-based model, this delamination of this lab and so on was important to... Uh, getting that hazard forecast going. And then these guides have been applied uh, in non-critical facilities as well. Uh, this is an example which uh, I think is out or coming out very soon uh, from Sullivan and his group on um, uh, long-term hazards on the island of Ischia. And so they have conceptual models of the volcanic activity and products. And they're using this framework to uh, basically justify and fund um, future volcanic hazard assessments for Ischia. Okay, so once you've done that, once you've characterized these sources, you screen for hazards. And um, in this case, so for Armenia, basically that involves making a geologic map <laughs> and uh, discovering what products are at the site, um, low aspect ratio ignimbrites, lava flows, and so on. And so you realize um, you cannot screen those hazards from consideration. Uh, an example from a non-critical facility on Kalima, uh, the flanks of Kalima volcano, there's a beautiful village, Tonila. So the question is, well, what are the likely impacts of uh, 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 lava flows or other products on Tonila? So you can run simulations based on, you know, all the lava flows historically have been relatively short, relatively small volume. Uh, what is the hazard associated with a slightly larger uh, volume lava flow? So uh, here's an example. It puts a high um, uh, burden on numerical models to be accurate and um, uh, useful, um, but now we know. Uh, yeah? You may, you, you may, excuse me, uh, George Bergans, you may go into this in great detail later, but I'm, I'm really excited to hear or, or interested to hear how do we assign 
quantitatively an uncertainty to our lack of knowledge of the, <laughs> that, that our models, even though we're, we think we're validated and so on. You right. Know, I, I'm, having done that, I'm, I'm much less confident now than I was before. Right. So, right, exactly. So the, so the short answer, so, so we have to guide against this. And in fact, there's a lot of discussion coming next week about that um, and, and in following conversations. But basically, that's a major issue. And that's why you use the logic tree to weight alternative models and to try to improve them with time, as Carolina said. OK, so you can wind up with uh, calculating a survivor function or an exceedance probability plot for a specific location like Tonila and tell the people there what's the likelihood, given an eruption of Kalima, uh, that uh, your town will be buried in Tefra, right? Um, so that's a useful plot in advance. So there are the three curves represent three different VEIs, not necessarily the, the best way to go as we discussed yesterday, but you can look at the probability of mass loading exceeding some value. And that's, again, based on a numerical model. Hey, people rely on volcanologists when they're thinking about screening hazards. And this is returning to the um, uh, Japan nuclear power plant. It's called the yeah, Ikata nuclear power plant I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is written by a lawyer. Don't read the whole thing right now. But uh, the high court shut down the power plant. We're shutting you down. And the, the important thing is the court found that it cannot conclude that the ASO-4 pyroclastic flow was very unlikely to reach the Ikata nuclear power plant. And so they closed it, right? So that's an example of using you know, society, using a hazard screening to make some decisions. So obviously, they you know, read Dufik and Brigance because, you know, this is across uh, the bay on the island of Shikoku and the PDC has to go across water. So somebody use that. Okay. So I'll talk uh, briefly about um, uh, how we look at rates of volcanic activity. Um, so this is an example of the frequency of uh, eruption clouds re re reaching northern Europe from Iceland. Uh, and... Um, so if you look at the tephra, or the crypto uh, tephra stratigraphic record in northern Europe, yet you can plot a series of events. Up here at the top, it's a cumulative distribution, which shows basically over the last 1,000 years, based on the data we have in the stratigraphic record, there's a, a fairly linear increase in uh, the cumulative number of eruptions as a function of time. And so you can plot that uh, with confidence limits and state that that's a, a stationary process and apply some model, in this case a relatively simple univariate model, to look at the frequency of these events, estimate the frequency of the, of the events, which of course depends on your data. And um, then you can look uh, at longer periods of time with the same record and see that things are actually not stationary over a longer period of time. So, um, uh, getting to George's question again in terms of recurrence rates, if you look at this, you can plot a survivor function or exceedance probability plot for repose. And um, so the data, it's just, uh, uh, that's just the one minus the cumulative distribution is shown on the right. And the data are shown as the step function. And you might fit a statistical model to that, in this Chuck? case, a univariate probability model. Chuck? Can, yeah. you just, can you just briefly explain state, what you mean by stationary or stationarity? Yeah, so for, for stationary, this uh, process, this data set appears to be stationary, which means that the uh, variance and mean value is not changing as a function of time. All right, that's the definition of stationary. And so if I apply many types of statistical models, I'm assuming I'm, I've got a stationary process. If you don't have a stationary process, you have to do something else. Uh, so anyway, um, here are some alternative statistical models, and you can use that to, say, forecast expected durations of repose. So that's the simplest sort of model. And uh, here's uh, data from one of Diana's favorite volcanoes, Mombotumbo, and uh, in Nicaragua, it erupted in um, 2015, and you can see that's an example of a non-stationary process, right? The blue cur curve, which is cumulative number of events, wanders outside of the zone of stationarity. So we, so we have to uh, use some alternative model, like a cluster or renewal model, to forecast the frequency of events. So if you think uh, things are non-stationary, if the rate of eruptions are increasing or decreasing with time on whatever time scale uh, floats your boat, then you have to use these other models. <clears throat> 
I'm going to very quickly go through an example of using this with a really bad data set. So I had to get Mars into a hazard talk. But um, these, are, these are volcanoes in the caldera, giant caldera of, of Arsiamans on Mars. And we can map uh, the distribution of lava flows there. And we can do a very crude job of dating the ages of these lava flows. And the way um, planetary geologists do that is they look at the size and number distribution of craters on those lava flows, and they guess, using a bombardment model, how long it took for those craters to form. And they wind up with a directed graph, not so different from an event tree. Uh, and the nodes on this are individual volcanic events, and they have some age distribution. If you look at that in detail, there's a wide range of age distributions. Um, so how do we include uncertainty in the radiometric or in this case, crater age uh, distributions and the stratigraphic data we've been, ex we've been able to extract from mapping. And we do some math and do some Monte Carlo simulations. And basically, what we wind up with is one of these cumulative distribution functions. So uh, how do I use stratigraphic information? I use a Monte Carlo method. I uh, pick a value based on crater age determination from the distribution of some intermediate unit. And that will create um, uh, boundaries on my probability distribution for other units that are in stratigraphic contact with that unit. So if I say the age of one unit is 90 million years old uh, in my simulation, then I probably have a truncated probability distribution for the, for the underlying unit. And of course, it depends on what that, what, what age you pick for that particular unit and which unit you pick first. So you can do a Monte Carlo simulation and get tens of thousands of uh, possible event values uh, and see how that changes your recurrence rate. So in this case, if I only use crater age dating, I get a broad distribution for volcanism and RCMons. If I use crater age dating in a stratigraphy, I get a little bit more structure and a little bit more um, constriction in the age range for that. And so we try to apply that sort of thing to various volcanic systems to better understand the rate. And uh, NASA did a press release on that. It was an article in EPSL by Jacob Richardson and others. And uh, wow, you want a lot of hits? Put Mars, volcano, Earth, dinosaurs, and extinction in the same tag. <laughs> I can't imagine how many 10-year-olds were really disappointed to click on that and get to an EPSL article. But anyway, <laughs> so, so we can continue that uh, with other examples. I just want to show one more from Armenia and this, uh, it, these ignimbrites. Uh, here's, here's a probability distribution which we're faced with when we do volcanic hazard assessment. Uh, uh, in this case, we're looking at time uh, before present and cumulative number of eruptions. And you know, there hasn't been an eruption in the last uh, you know, 400,000 years or 450,000 years or so. So the question there, this is that ignimbrite shield I showed you before. The question is, is that volcano extinct or not? And um, uh, you know, we're keenly aware of all this esoteric literature on magmatic processes and residence times of magmas and you know, what does that mean for our, you know, we refused to say it was extinct. So we decided that our model should not include, we pruned the branch about whether it was extinction, extinct or not. We didn't, we didn't address that question. Instead, we considered alternative recurrence rates based on uh, the data available and the fact that no eruption had happened in the last um, few hundred thousand years. And so when we run the event tree for low aspect ratio ignimbrite inundating the site, we take into account these alternative age models and we wind up with an aggregate probability. And for a critical facility, the probability is kind of high, um, 10 to the minus six, uh, 10, 10 to the minus seventh. Uh, so um, that puts a lot of onus on figuring out from a uh, magmatic system perspective, whether the, our estimates of the recurrence rate are appropriate or not. Of course, there's huge social implications for this power plant. It's already built, uh, it's already operating, provides all the power for Armenia. So they saw, said, okay, that's fine, we'll keep going. All right, and then um, forecasting location matters, as somebody mentioned uh, frequently, or was mentioned frequently yesterday. And so here's this example from Kalima again. If I simply 
move the vent a few uh, hundred meters uh, for lava flow effusion, the hazard on the flanks of the volcano changes tremendously. So that puts a lot of uh, onus on understanding where vents are going to form. And so one way to look at the probability of vent formation using the rock record is to look at where vents have occurred in the past. We use something called a kernel density function to do that. Basically, in orange are the volcanoes. We want to estimate the probability of a vent forming at the location S. And we can use a kernel density function, just like you guys are using in seismology or whatever. It depends on this matrix H. And H controls the shape of the kernel and the rotation of the kernel. Uh, and which might respond to tectonic activity or orientation, you know, prevalent orientations of dikes or whatever. And we apply that to a problem. Okay, so here's a probability density function. Where will new stratocones form in the Tahoku arc? <laughs> right? So it's based on our conversation yesterday. There are two alternative probability models there. Okay? Which are basically two alternative estimations of what that bandwidth matrix H should look like. One, on the right-hand side, looks like a pretty classical subduction zone model, right? It's, uh, there's little variation along the arc. So that's fit to the same data. Uh, the quaternary volcano distribution is shown in white dots. And we got a kind of an arc-like model. And then if I use a different statistical model, I wind up with the panel on the left, which obviously emphasizes a long arc variation in rates, productivity of magmatic systems. So that's what a statistical model gets for you. I can tell you <laughs> whatever answer you want it to be based on how I estimate these parameters. So how do I constrain these parameters? Obviously, I've got to build in additional data. Uh, so Dao Ping Zhao did a bunch of early work on slowness in the uh, velocity field uh, in the mantle beneath the Tohoku arc. Uh, Martin used that information to try to inform probability models of the likelihood of volcano formation in the arc. You can see that it's somewhat clustered and somewhat um, uh, lacking in variation along arc. And um, another data set that's been used extensively there is, is gravity data and uplift history of the arc. And I won't go into it in detail, but if, uh, Ophelia George modeled uh, intrusion geometries associated with the largest clusters in the arc, uh, including the Sengen cluster in Tohoku, and found that these huge gravity anomalies, I mean, those, those are whopping gravity anomalies, uh, you know, 20 milligals over a distance of 50 kilometers is a lot. Those are ex explained by mid-crustal processes. And so she used uh, G-Tecton, a numerical simulation code for uh, uplift, to show that the magnitudes of uplift we see of metamorphic basement in the Tohoku arc are explained by these mid-crustal anomalies, right? So that favors the clustered model compared to um, the uniform along the arc model. So people do explore this. Um, and of course, you can think of how your data would fit into that sort of model. Monogenetic volcanism also came up yesterday as, uh, you know, how do we forecast distributed volcanic hazards? And here's an example. This is the Eastern Snake River Plain that uh, Brandon Schmidt talked about earlier. And all those dots are uh, relatively young volcanoes mapped at the surface on the Snake River Plain. Um, I'm just attracted to nuclear facilities. The white outline is um, the Idaho National Lab. It's the largest nuclear facility on Earth. It's in the middle of an uh, active volcanic field. Go figure. Anyway, uh, so the question is, how likely is it that lava flows will inundate the INL in the future, right? Um, and so we can use um, geologic data to look at the frequency at, with which the plain is paved by new lava flows. The blue, deep blue, are less than 15,000 years old there. We can use geophysical data. Here's uh, Brent's paper showing um, geophysical anomalies in the eastern Snake River Plain. So obviously, it's underlain by a slow region, which might mean that um, conceptually, melt production is certainly possible. We can use those spatial density models, the statistical models, to contour where vents are likely to form, given that an eruption occurs on a plane, sort of weight them, maybe in a Bayesian way, using the um, data from uh, tomography and other sources and come up with this model. And, and um, you can see that um, there are zones of high and low productivity, but basically we get this elongate feature. It's interesting, some of the details here, um, 
actually agree pretty well with the seismic tomography. You can see uh, in the southwest how it begins to feather out on the, in the western part of the eastern Snake River Plain. We see that in the distribution of volcanoes as well. And so um, Liz Gallant, in a recent paper, uh, took that spatial density model. Um, there's some details here I'm skipping in the interest of time, but she simulated lava flows and showed what the probability of inundation of the site area is based on um, these statistical and numerical models. And so then, you know, in a, you know, that might be one node in that logic tree, and you have to consider alternative models. This is kind of important. Um, some people are hanging our future energy uh, needs on the new scale reactor developed in Eugene, I think? Corvallis, Corvallis. okay, sorry, sorry. And um, uh, they want to they test that at the INL. And um, so the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is making them do a volcanic hazard assessment. Okay, really fast, one of the things about those trees, you know, like the event tree, the most common tree used in volcanology, it's been incredibly successful. And, it, and things progress from left to right, right? From there's uh, a magmatic system, there's magmatic unrest, magma is ascending, magma erupts, and so on. And the question is, how do our data fit into that? And the answer is not necessarily very well. There, there are issues with this. Uh, and this is a beautiful paper by Thea Hinks and colleagues, and it shows how we might address the problem. And the problem, I can say, I can state using uh, Bayes' theorem, and that is this conditional probability. The, the probability of magmatic unrest, given an increase in SO2, for example, is not <laughs> the probability of an increase in SO2 given magma unrest. That's what Bayes said. You know, and uh, that's a pretty important scientific idea. Kind of violated a little bit in the event tree, right? We're kind of glossing over that. So um, Thea described a, a hidden Bayesian network, uh, which is a slightly more sophisticated model that I think is going to gain traction in the community. Basically, we have a hidden variable, which we want to know about. Maybe call it magma unrest, call it magma ascent, whatever you want. And that might result in eruption, which is this output node shown in pink. And that's informed by observations, in this case, geophysical or geochemical observations we can make. But oddly, the unrest is causing the observation we make, right? It's not the other way around. <laughs> so our event tree is, is not entirely appropriate. So I need to use a, a, some sort of a Bayesian model or perhaps a Kalman filter or something like that to forecast then what the change in magma unrest leading to eruption is given my geophysical observations. And if that seems totally off base to you, the, the idea is that um, you know, if you think about, uh, this is really well developed in the medical community. So if you have a test for a disease, what's the likelihood that you have a true positive versus a false positive? What's the likelihood of a false negative? It's the same issue exactly. And so we really need to think about how our geophysical observations or geochemical observations fit into this network. And of course, the network can grow unbelievably complex. Uh, and so if you have a conceptual model of a volcanic system, you might have magma ascending, which leads to a perturbation in the hydrothermal system, or deeper processes might lead to a perturbation in the hydrothermal system. Those are hidden concepts. We don't observe that directly, right? That's, that's our model of the volcanic system. That's informed by the blue observations and tells us about the probability of the red observations. And so, so models, you know, for example, a model of how the volcano responds uh, geodetically or seismically to inflation inform those transition probabilities which are informed by data. And so that's um, a Bayesian network. Often it's called a Bayesian belief network for reasons we'll get into later on. And finally, another issue with the event tree is volcano eruptions are actually more complicated, right? So uh, for example, we might be interested in the transition from one type of eruptive activity to another. And so there's a paper I mentioned the other day, Jenkins and Bebbington, where they look using a uh, Markov model essentially to look at the probability of changes in activity. And they relied on the Smithsonian catalog. They relied on those reports of the sequence of events in volcanic eruptions from 7,000 or more different eruptions. And so here, um, they're looking at the duration of uh, 
volcanoes in continuous explosion, like a Strombolian event, something like that, Strombolian eruption or Strombolian phase of activity, and the likelihood that that'll transition to another phase of activity. It might end, that's shown in the blue curve, and that changes as a function of duration of the event, or it might ramp up to intermediate, intermittent explosions, uh, say less pulsatory uh, than this one. And there's, of course, a very low probability in this particular case of a major eruption, which is sort of subplinian, if you want, in a, uh, or a plinian phase eruption. So basically, this is like the Bayesian network. The nodes are different styles of activity, and they connect in sort of a train wreck, right? Uh, uh, that's why I'm not showing you the diagram, is everything's connected to everything else, and you look at the probability of that happening. So they, they did this based on the historic record of observations. There's all kinds of tricks and problems they're well aware of with um, the quality of the catalog and so on. You could consider how models might fit into those transitions as well. Like how might those transitions be informed by the types of uh, conceptual or numerical models we have of volcanic systems. So we've got some challenges, and I just want to, I'll just go through them briefly. Uh, uh, long-term hazard, one, one big problem we have is long-term hazard assessment, at least the way I've outlined it here, is not widespread. Um, so uh, the most common probability map is the type of probability, uh, uh, hazard map is the type I showed you for Iceland. Where have events happened in the past? Maybe that's where things are dangerous, right? Okay, by far that's the uh, penetration in the community. I, I gotta say, uh, probabilistic seismic hazard assessment, of course, of course the hazard rates are much higher than volcanism, but their community has really moved forcefully into PSHA, and so there are probably dozens of, of companies around us here in the Berkeley area or Walnut Creek or whatever, where lots of seismologists are employed doing PSHA, and uh, it ha it's ten tended to be a bit more ad hoc in the volcano community. We have to do better. I would argue that once there's unrest, it may be too late, right? I mean, how come, how come we don't know about these things in advance? Okay, uh, new structures in, uh, for hazard assessment are likely to emerge, as I just alluded to a minute ago. Uh, and as George said, this places a real premium on this process puts a real premium on every aspect of volcano science, from the conceptual model to the numerical model of a lahar. Uh, uh, we have to have confidence in the model. So we have to have uh, confidence in our understanding of the rates of activity as well. You know, radiometric age determinations in the Western United States, man, we're just getting started. How, how, how do we improve that situation? How do we have more data available about um, ages of volcanic rocks? And uh, I want to, the, the last bullet is just sort of a way to summarize this dichotomy between short term and long term that I mentioned earlier. Uh, how do we actually move toward using geophysical data or geochemical data to compare volcanoes and their likelihood to erupt, say, on a hundred year time scale or a thousand year time scale rather than a yearly time scale? Uh, and, that's what society wants from us. They want to know where to put the power plant. They want to know, um, is this city in a reasonable spot or not? Well, nobody wants to know that, actually, but they should want to know that. And, and uh, uh, you know, so, so that's where we need to go with some of these methods. So thanks. Okay, question. Uh, sorry, one more thing. I want to acknowledge a whole ton of people uh, boy, that's a laundry list of volcanologists who contributed to that development of that, those IAEA guidelines, including some uh, real old-time superstars like Aramaki, Sergio Aramaki. So, okay, go ahead. Okay. Questions, comments? Larry. So in, uh, in the USGS, we're moving towards a new generation of hazard assessments that we're trying to get more quantitative and probabilistic. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing we found, so if you're dealing with, uh, with nuclear engineers, they understand probabilities. If you're dealing with county emergency managers, it's a little bit more difficult 
Right. So I guess my question is, what's your experience dealing with people outside the nuclear industry, and how do you convey these hazard assessments that involve probabilities to people who aren't used to thinking in those terms? Yeah. Um, first, I should say I'm not personally good at that communication. We need, we need people <laughs> who actually know how to do that very effectively. Um, and, but my actual experience is it's quite variable. So in Leon, Nicaragua, I talked to the mayor about the um, hazard curve for TEFRA fallout in Leon. He got it immediately. I don't know why. Um, on the other hand, people, other people, you say probability and you know, they say, hey, I need a prediction. Is it going to erupt or not? Is TEFRA going to be a problem or not? And so mapping um, this probabilistic statement into you know, the statement a, a government agency needs to make is extremely challenging. Um, I think uh, there's enough of a challenge to get our ducks in a row in terms of how the community actually estimates the probability. <laughs> and then we have to decide how, uh, how to actually um, uh, convey that information. I mean, it, it really depends a lot on your population and who you're talking to, you know, whether, um, whether those are effective or not. I, I can say, hey, I'm from Florida. <laughs> so, so it's interesting. Some, somebody brought up uh, hazard indexes or, or um, uh, that sort of thing yesterday as a group project. And um, everyone in Florida has the information available to them, whether they should, they may not listen to it, but whether they need to evacuate in a category five or four or three storm, and whether they don't need to evacuate. It's a very effective mode of communication. So we're, we're a little caught up maybe in um, the different styles of hazards and their impacts, but you can imagine an index uh, that you could relate on a county by county basis that would um, tell people whether they need to evacuate or not based on, say, some measure of the magnitude of expected activity. And that that information could be conveyed as an index that people would understand. They never heard of a PDC, they don't want to know, but they know they need to leave. Um, so there's, there's other fields that address this problem. So, um, Kerry Cooper from UC Davis. I'm not sure if this question is answerable, but I was struck by your point in the end in terms of we basically need a lot more data to inform these models in order to, to really have you know, high precision models, if you, if you will. Um, but I was wondering, within that spectrum, and we need more of everything, I'm sure, but within that spectrum, are there particular types of data that are <coughs> consistently a problem in terms of moving forward, in terms of, you know, where are the choke points in our understanding of these things that would at least kind of take things to the next level and then we can improve all the rest of the data up to a similar level? Yeah. So I can say that in practice right now, um, the, the, the tools that are used the most are screening distance. Will a PDC of a given volume reach your site? And the reason is uh, simulations are cheap. <laughs> I can make those simulations. If I believe my model, I, I go that way. Um, the greatest uncertainties are in the rates of volcanic activity and how we inform those models. Um, so um, it's, I, I, I have to say it's pathetic. <laughs> we, 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 we really, even in some of our most active systems, don't really understand the variations in rates. Um, radiometric age determinations get you kind of far in terms of understanding what's happened in the past. We're certainly not forecasting what possible variation in rates might occur due to our understanding of a magmatic system. That's a huge problem. Uh, Josh Crozier, Oregon. Uh, do you know if there's been much effort to run sort of Monte Carlo simulations of things like lava flows with di different configurations of, say, earth mounds to, to like earth mounds divert? Said. Oh, oh, for, for oh, engineering, <laughs> volcano engineering. Yeah. You're talking about. Uh, well, um, there's a long history of, of uh, interest in that. Um, certainly, dikes have been built on Mount Etna in an effort to divert flows, which have been sort of successful, kind of. There's a long story there. Um, Jaeger, back in uh, the 30s, discussed different methods of uh, diverting lava flows from Hilo. Those were never constructed. I think, I can't remember who it was, and I apologize, but 
Somebody did a calculation where they looked at how big a, a, a ditch you would need to divert a lava flow from Mauna Loa, for example, and it was something like six kilometers wide. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem. And, and I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not remembering exactly who did that. Um, and certainly there have been other efforts. People have tried to uh, increase the rate of cooling of lava flows by bombing uh, crusted over lava flows, literally. Kind of a, I love that response, but probably not practical. And um, people have tried to cool lava flows. For example, in Iceland, it's, it's very uncertain whether with seawater, for example, they probably didn't have much effect on the lava flow through that process. So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, engineering solutions, of course, uh, for uh, lahars and that kind of thing, people have built um, various types of dams and engineered structures to try to reduce flow velocities and channels. So I, I, I think there's a lot to be considered there. Um, the volumes are what kills you. <laughs> the momentum kills you. It's, uh, these, these are really big things that are you know, larger than most of our engineered structures can, can deal with. But there, there may be a future there. Uh, so Hurwitz, um, many of these processes or the assessments heavily rely on recurrence intervals, yet many of the processes are not very periodic. <laughs> So how do, how is this quantified, let's say, in such assessments? Uh, how is uncertainty in the recurrence well, interval quantified? Yeah, because again, in earthquakes especially, they also rely heavily on recurrence intervals, and yet earthquakes are not very periodic in many cases. Yeah, um, so uh, I, we'll go somewhere back here, too far. Um, if we look at... We can look at this from a variety of perspectives. So this is one way to deal with it. Um, and this is to look at alternative models. And I, I skipped over this pretty fast, but uh, remember in this volcano case, it has been erupted in 450,000 years. So a simple way to do it uh, practically is that if we assume there has been no activity in the last 400,000 years, then what's the likelihood that a given recurrence rate could be true? And it turns out if your recurrence rate is pretty high, then it's highly unlikely you'll have a gap that long. Okay, so, so that kind of negative information can inform models in a practical sense. But, I mean, I gotta say that renewal models and, and um, uh, other method, higher resolution in, in, in what the changes in the geologic record are will be helpful. So an example might come from the SEMA volcanic field in California where um, we know there were Large, there was a large change in the rate of activity um, about 100,000 years ago. And so why that happened, I'm not sure, but we have the resolution to show that change in activity occurred. So, so the models try to uh, account for variations in activity, but as I said before, in a practical sense, people try to screen hazards uh, rather than base an assessment on a recurrence rate just because of these problems. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. Thanks. Um, I, I, over here. I really enjoyed that. Uh, Adam Kent from, from the place where they make the new scale power reactors <laughs> in, in Cobalt. I hope Authority. they build it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're actually pretty cool. Um, I have a question. You know, one thing about the geologic record, and I think volcanoes are good examples of this because they can often obscure or destroy their own history as yes. they go forward. So, so are there sort of I mean, obviously, people must have thought of this. So there are ways developed to sort of work out what you may not know. And as you get further away from where we are now, that the probability of not seeing a critical event increases in the geologic record just because of erosion and destruction. That's exactly right. So that's why I love working on distributed volcanic fields. They're all spread out, and I can see the whole record. <laughs> but but uh, in composite systems, uh, it's remarkable how little of the record you see in a lot of places. Um, this was a big problem in the Armenia example, which I show here. Uh, so I, I showed the most recent episode of, vol of volcanism in that recurrence rate plot, but it seems there were at least two older episodes, which are only known from deposits in canyons, uh, which were much older. So there's like hiatuses in activity, which we wouldn't know about, except for the serendipity of um, you know, the topography of that volcano. So Eichelberger has a solution, just drill it. And um, you know, uh, certainly that's informed the solution at INL where they have the budget to drill it uh, and the resources. And um, uh, you can 
you can look at the history of volcanic activity on the INL in the vertical as well as the horizontal. So that's one way to address it. Um, Good point. Now it's a lot in Hawaii. Yes. Yes. Right, so, so with that stratigraphic record from drilling and radiometric age determinations and so on, you have a, um, an empirical exceedance probability plot. How often am, is my real estate paved? Um, and then you're, that'll inform your models, that, you know, statistical or numerical that you build from that. So just a comment about, I guess, hazard communication. So one of the things that I do also in my spare time is watch geysers because I'm geyser obsessed. Now you all know that a lot. <laughs> uh, but one of the things I do is, you know, you have these geysers that you know are about to erupt and you want to tell people around you that, hey, this thing is about to erupt. And it's interesting trying to see what um, you can tell people to actually get them to stay. And sometimes that means sharing information. Oh, this is taller than Old Faithful. Don't go leave to Old Sea Old Faithful mm -hmm. right now when you can see this thing that's taller. And sometimes it's, oh, they have kids. You can tell them, hey, this geyser makes toilet noises. Your kids will love it. Um, <laughs> so I guess, is, is this maybe a chance to kind of uh, work with people from geocognition and social, scientists, uh, social sciences to kind of see what people value, what kinds of things people listen to in terms of accurately getting across these kind of complicated probabilistic hazard assessments? Yeah, I, I, I think so, and I'm definitely not an expert on that. I did have a um, grad student, Katie Carter, who's now at the Arizona Museum, um, go to Flagstaff, and she told one group of people the probability of lava inundation is one in 10,000 per year, or one in 100,000 per year. And they were like, okay, thanks, and did their shopping. And uh, other people she showed, uh, they ran a simulation of a lava flow on, on her um, iPad, and just to, just to look at the differences in reaction and, and engagement, um, it's kind of interesting. But that's just like, you know, there, there's a universe of things to do there, for sure. There's a lot more that could be done. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, one, one of your co-authors up there was Chris, or collaborators, it was Chris Newhall. And I think he, or Larry, I'm sure, and the CEO folks know this, in the, in the aftermath of the St. Helens eruption, the loggers, Weyerhaeuser wanted to pull, do salvage logging, and the loggers said, no way, man. <laughs> We're gonna, we don't want to get hit by the volcano again. Yeah. And then some of the USGS folks said, well, the, the probability is whatever, one in a thousand, which is meaningless. But then when it was phrased as, well, the probability of a logging accident is also one in a thousand, suddenly it was a context that they were familiar with, and it, was, it, was a, it, provided, well, it provided context. Because one, one in a thousand is totally meaning, meaningless, but if you're working with logging equipment and you know oh, that's, it, it's a double the hazard. And then yeah. they were actually able to say, well, pay us double and we'll go and do it, and Weyerhaeuser did. Yeah. So. Yeah, and Willie asked, Willie yeah. did a lot of that in Montserrat, comparing to... Yeah, hurricanes. Comparing yeah. To, you know, automobile accidents. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, that comparison is really uh, incredibly useful. And also, you can tune it to your population. So remember at the beginning, I said, you know, are you 10 or are you a logger? Your, your perception of hazard is really completely different, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the 10-year-old logger is a different beast. <laughs> I'm sure they're out there. Hi, I'm Sean Maher from UC Santa Barbara. Um, I'm wondering when a volcano is in a state of magmatic unrest, which types of signals like geophysics or geochemistry are most useful in terms of forecasting and putting together an event tree and following from that um, what's, what are some future research directions for relating those, those precursor signals to, to subsequent eruptions? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so um, the best technique is the technique you're using, right? I mean, that's, that's the thing. So uh, most, most, the most widespread technique is some sort of seismology uh, for looking at unrest, and that's, that's got to do with the um, availability and expertise in the instrumentation and also its success, but um, there's no doubt that integrated methods are um, very powerful. And actually, when we do the tutorial, we'll look at a Bayesian event tree and, and look at the differences in probability when we only have seismic data versus when we have seismic and gas data. Uh, 
and how that reinforces our understanding of the system. So correlating um, observations is quite powerful, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to focus on any one technique. I mean, where people are the best in forecasting eruptions, they have the most data from a variety of, of uh, instruments. Hi, it's Hannah from University of Bristol. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on where, I guess I would call them like midterm hazards fit in. So you showed the example at the start of the Panabach disaster, which is obviously not, well, I can't remember, but it wasn't an ongoing eruption. So things like debris, debris flows or resuspension of volcanic material, where does that fit into the kind of approach of the trees and, and so on? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So, so uh, the event trees, as, as um, the plot from Augusto Neri and colleagues showed, um, can be developed for long-term hazard or short-term hazard. So if you're using that, there really is no reason not to look at intermediate scale hazards. Um, I'd say that um, I'd hazard to say there's some bias in the community uh, toward um, frequently active volcanoes because those are the most fun to work on. You've got a signal and um, you, you have that kind of information. So, so things are changing. Uh, so it's long dormant volcanoes um, have generally less information and less attention paid to them. I think there's great hope for using um, geophysical methods to look at um, the likely, you know, think of the, think of the seismic tomographic anomaly, uh, not necessarily only in the volume fraction of melt or something like that, but in what that means in terms of the probability that the volcano will become active, say, on a decadal time scale or a 100-year time scale, which I guess you mean as intermediate. Um, so yeah. Um, you definitely hate to be caught by volcanoes that are not historically active. Um, and that definitely does occur, as in the Toliman case. The most fatalities in Nicaragua from volcanic activity are associated with a volcano called Casitas, which hasn't, ha hasn't not erupted in the Holocene. It experienced collapse during Hurricane Mitch. Uh, Tom Shea, uh, University of Hawaii. Um, I was wondering, you know, in the age of sort of big data and data repositories, um, whether <coughs> there have been uh, efforts um, to try and, and get some database that would be useful um, for sort of comparisons between um, you yes. know, vol volcanoes where it's not just a recurrence rate, but, you know, type of volcano, et cetera, but maybe even where uh, uh, people could put uh, hazards maps, um, mm -hmm. et cetera, because I guess the, um, it seems to me like it, there's a good reflex to um, assess hazard uh, really for that particular site or volcano, but perhaps a little less effort in trying to um, uh, compare and contrast with other places. I wish I was starting my career right now because that is just an awesome development that's going to happen in volcanology, I predict. Um, <laughs> so, uh, for example, um, you know, numerical models are, the best numerical models are expensive to run. Um, can we make libraries of numerical simulations that are accessed by a database in order to facilitate hazards? So, so if, you, if uh, uh, someone runs a whole suite of simulations, they don't need to link that to the probability of those occurring or even the probable magnitudes of the events. You could interrogate that database with alternative models later on. So that's definitely one thing that's going to happen. So, so it's odd, but think of big data as a lot of simulation results, and you're immediately on that path. Um, and, and there are other aspects of this as well. Um, so, uh, Bayesian networks, uh, Kalman filters, similar sorts of strategies um, put a lot of emphasis on data assimilation. Uh, and uh, there are some beautiful papers coming out about, say, Kalman filters. I think you're going to hear about this later in the CIDR um, from Patricia Gregg. Uh, there are um, uh, uh, great successes in 
meteorological forecasting and the like involving data assimilation um, at an ongoing rate. So I'd say that as a, as a group, we're um, going to have a lot of success in folding models into estimation of the nodes. And um, my hope is that these various tree structures, the logic tree, Bayesian network, or even the event tree, give you context for doing that. So that definitely is a very powerful, very powerful methods are out there. I should point out that the Bayesian network, you use, you use them every day uh, when you're doing a search on Google or whatever. Um, that's where the big data is used to know what ad to put on your Gmail <laughs> and things like that. I mean, so people are gaining a lot of experience in computational science with these sorts of strategies. Okay, it's time for our coffee break. Let's thank Chuck. Thank you.